Hello, hello. What's up, everybody? This is Alex from X Trades, and welcome back to another weekly trade ideas list. We did not have a video last week. I apologize for not releasing one. I had to take an emergency flight back home to Chicago. My grandpa was extremely sick, still is very, very sick, literally has the worst kind of brain tumor you could get. Unfortunately, it is inoperable. So I had to go spend some time with him. He's doing a little bit better now, but we are going to try our best to get chemo and get him treated anything we can do to maybe shrink it but it's not looking good guys so please pray for my grandfather if you follow that or just you know keep him in your thoughts send some good karma into the air for him we need it so i had a lot going on last week unfortunately i was not able to do the video but hopefully this week we can drop a pretty good video as you can see i really haven't been active i mean the last trade i closed for alerts was nine days ago we did close that old pfe trade I think this was on the list a couple weeks ago. That worked out pretty good. Also, those QQQ calls from a couple weeks ago, that played out pretty well as well. But I'm hoping to find some trades this week. Last week, I didn't really do anything. I got back home to South Carolina on Wednesday. And then the markets got very slow Thursday and Friday. So I didn't really do much. We did take one trade on UNG. We took UNG calls in the challenge account. I have a $300 challenge account that we've turned to 570 so far, so not too bad. Made 30 bucks on those UNG calls, but otherwise, I mean, I've only done a couple of scalps, maybe made like 200 bucks on my main account last week, so I really didn't make much because I really didn't trade much, but hopefully this week we'll be more active. We have lots of data, and we'll go over that right now. So for Monday, we do have a couple of Fed speakers here. We got Fed Vice Chair Philip Jefferson and Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester together on a panel. It's going to be at 9 a.m., 30 minutes before the bell. And then on Tuesday, it's going to be a bigger one. It's going to be the producer price index. So it's similar to the CPI, but on the producer side. So it's a pretty important inflation gauge. We definitely want to see that cooling down. We've seen prices kind of be sticky on a lot of things. So we want to see those prices coming lower on everything. Producer side, consumer, we want to see those rate cut odds increase. Obviously, that's what we've been paying attention to since 2022. Ever since this rate hike cycle started, we've pretty much been pricing in rate cuts or trying to. Even when it was really obvious that inflation was not coming down at a rate that the Fed wanted to see, we were not nowhere near the 2% goal that the Fed wanted to see. People were still talking about Fed pivots, Fed rate cuts in 2022 and 2023. And here we still are, higher for longer. Rates have not changed. And we pretty much paused every single meeting for 2024 and a little bit for 2023 as well. So if we want to see those rate cut odds increase and we want to see, you know, one to three cuts this year by the end of the year, we need to see the Fed's inflation goal being hit, or at least a little bit closer to it on the PCE index. Even see the CPI come down as well. Even though they don't use CPI for policy, they use the PCE. CPI is still very important, as well as PPI on the producer side. So Tuesday is going to be PPI, obviously. We also do have Lisa Cook speaking, another Fed member, and also Jerome Powell at 10 a.m., I'm not exactly sure what he's going to be saying, but we can look it up real quick. So Tuesday, the 14th, we do have a live discussion with Chair Jerome Powell. It looks like it's going to be at some banking institution at the annual general meeting foreign bankers association in Amsterdam. So that could be interesting. I'm just not sure if he's going to comment much on monetary policy, but we'll see. Obviously with Jerome Powell, anything is subject to move in the market. And then on Wednesday, the most important day of the week, it's going to be the CPI. And I'll show you why it's so important here. We can go over to this website. You can see that these inflation readings have been very sticky. So you can see every single report this year for CPI has came in a little bit hotter. We had a forecast at 3.2% for January. That came in at 3.4. For February, we had a forecast at 2.9, coming at 3.1. For March, we had a forecast at 3.1, coming at 3.2. And our last one coming at 3.4 for the forecast, actual was at 3.5. So all higher than expected, very sticky inflation. That's why we need to come in below this forecast at 3.4. Also, it will come below the previous at 3.5. So this will be pretty important. Hopefully, we can come in at 3.3, maybe a little bit lower. Wouldn't be surprised if it comes in line, too. That happens a lot with a lot of inflation readings. It'll magically come in as expected on every front. So that's why the CPI is so important. Every single reading this year has come in higher than expectations. We also have retail sales that day as well. It's going to be at 8.30. That'll be important. Looks like we have Cash Kari and also Bowman speaking as well later in the day. So pretty important on Wednesday, we got retail sales and CPI. Definitely pay attention to that. And then on Thursday, nothing really big except for maybe the Philadelphia Fed manufacturing survey. This is a hit or miss if it moves the market, but sometimes it can. Also have a couple of Fed speakers that day. We got Williams, Michael Barr testifying, also Loretta Mester, and also Bostic speaking towards the end of the close. And that's really it. Other than Friday, uh, we have a 
another Fed speaker, Fed Governor Christopher Waller, and that's about it. So most important is going to be CPI, obviously, on Wednesday. Also retail sales, second most important. PPI probably, and also maybe Chair Jerome Powell. Is, I mean, Chair Jerome Powell could end up being one of the most important things of the week. You just never really know if he's going to comment on monetary policy or not. So that's for the economic calendar. Pretty stacked this week. Definitely a little bit more exciting than last week. And on to the boring seasonality this week. You can see it's very boring. Nothing really crazy here for the 13th to the 17th. We do have a monthly options expiration here, May 17th. So Friday could be a little bit volatile. Really, any of those monthly options expirations, they can really move crazy. And you'll see a lot of violent swings, you know, the first couple hours of open. And then kind of towards the end of the session, you'll start seeing a chop a lot. But I would definitely expect that volatility definitely on the 17th on Friday, especially at the beginning of the open. But otherwise, you can see that the system is back testing short trades here. You can see that winning trades only have 40%, summarized profit at negative 3%. So nothing really crazy here. You can see there's kind of a little up thrust. So if we start at the 13th, went to that, went to that, went to that, you can see it gradually increasing up into the 16th. But that's really about it. You don't really see anything too special here. And we really haven't followed this May downside seasonality much in the last 20 years. So usually it's a sell in May and go away. That's kind of the saying for May, but we've actually had a pretty solid kind of bullish May so far. Might have had a couple hiccups, but that's about it. You can see at the end of the month is kind of when it gets a little bit bigger, about the 24th or so. You'll see that big up thrust maybe up into June, and that's about it. Otherwise, I mean, seasonality has been pretty quiet. Really haven't been following the downside or anything like that. And especially for this week, there's really not anything leaning too big here. So I wouldn't really say that the seasonality can really give us too much information here. Maybe a slight bounce if we kind of follow this three-day pattern here where it slightly goes up. But nothing really special kind of sticking out. We're not really seeing like a big trend or big up thrust or big down move here for this week specifically. If we go down to 10 years though... You can see it kind of changes. We have winning trades at 70%, summarized profit at 5% with a decent up thrust here. So the last 10 years of data here, pretty good. Seven gains, three losses, pretty solid. I mean, it's most recent years, definitely looking a little bit more positive here compared to the 20 year data set. But obviously this has a little bit less data. So we could kind of go with a maybe slight bullish till. Obviously it's not like a huge move or anything, but 10 year data set looking pretty good. 20 year data set looking kind of flat. So obviously seasonality can't really give you insight into geopolitical issues or random data events, you know, Fed members talking, stuff like that. But it can give you some insight into kind of how the seasonal trend works. And lots of times it will follow the seasonal trend kind of quarter by quarter. And that's why we go over it week by week as well. Kind of give an idea of what we could maybe be going into for the week. But like I said, this week, nothing really special. The 10-year data set did look pretty good. Like I said, you had about seven winners, three losers the last 10 years to the upside here. So looking pretty solid, just nothing too crazy. And on to the setups for this week. I do only have two individual names this week. I went through 200 plus tickers. I can even show you my list here. This watch list right here is 230 almost. I go through every single one and I usually find about six or seven and I break that down into three. This time I could really only find two that I really liked for potential. And even with these, I mean, it's not like the greatest setups in the world. The market looks very slow right now especially in indexes, you can kind of see money rotating into other things, small caps and, you know, kind of stuff that's been very oversold. You can tell that Wall Street's getting a little bit bored with the indexes and that money starts rotating into more volatile names, stuff with higher volatility, you know, small caps, stuff like that, even industrials and other sectors, healthcare, utilities, things like that. So it was a little bit quiet last week, but I mean, pretty good for the indexes, closed up green, had a pretty nice recovery. But for Meta here, it's pretty simple. It's a 61.8 to 50% Fibonacci retracement. So from this point right here down to this point, this is your 61.8 and this is your 50% retracement. So this is now retraced 50% of the move from this high to this low after earnings. So it's had a pretty good retracement. The reason why I don't have the rest of the fibs up is because I'm only interested in the 50 and the 61.8. You could even add a 38.2 if you're feeling spicy because that's a pretty good fib as well. But right now we are at the 50 and 61.8 level. So I don't need a 38.2. So since it's already bounced 50% of the move, and it's already recovered a decent amount. Now we wanna start looking for some type of rejection signal, some type of resistance. You can see we're kinda of starting to close over the 921 EMA combo. So we don't really have a reversal signal yet. You might need Meta to close back under the 921 combo if you get a close under that level, probably about 465s. 
that could signal a move back down, probably take you back down to 446 and so on and so forth. But you really can't project any lower than 446 because it could act as a back test. So it can come back down, hold this as support and bounce back up. So really you're going to be playing the patience game with this one because we really don't have a rejection bar just yet. We don't have a crazy rejection signal. If we can get back under the 50, this little 50% level at about 7, 473, that could be good as well. That could signal a move down, maybe even take out Friday's low. So Friday's low is at about 470 or so. Take out Friday's low, that could definitely flush down. Right now with puts, it's a little bit more sketchy because we have a very low VIX. We'll go over that later. We have VIX basically below 13 now coming up to lows, which makes things feel a lot slower. And people just buy dips when VIX is this low. So for any put trade in a low VIX environment, you want to be very careful, wait for the right signals. Don't just try to short the tops just because you think it's the top. For example, Meta could still have some room here up to the 61.8. 61.8 is a pretty sought after ratio and it could reach up there first before rejecting. But I do want to bring some awareness to this 50% to 61.8 level because there could be a short term resistance pattern as it usually always does if it's already retraced 50% to 61.8% of its move, especially in a little down measure like this. There's a good chance we could see a quick little flush and you can make some really good put scalp on this or really any name coming up to a 50% or 61.8%. So that's what I'm watching for meta. Like I said, wait for a better one day candle. Maybe you could even wait for it to get back under the moving averages. If you have to, there could still be a little bit more room up to the 61.8 or maybe even the 50 SMA right here, which meets right with the 61.8. So you don't really have a signal here yet, but I do want to watch for a potential resistance here. So I would not just start entering puts right away. On Monday, unless you have a really good signal, definitely wait for an obvious signal, maybe a move under 470, move under 465 or so, and that could set you up for a little fall down to 446. So that's for meta, be patient. You don't really have anything crazy here signaling a reversal just yet, but definitely watch this 50 to 61.8% area. It's pretty important. All right, number two for our individual names. This is PLTR. They just had earnings recently. Usually I don't like playing a stock after it's already had earnings, at least for a couple of weeks or at least a week or so. It did report on Tuesday, so we're coming into a new week. So pretty much been trading for almost a week. The one thing I do like about this is that it has a pretty good support here at 2033. You can see that this is a pretty strong bounce level. Also a pretty old resistance right here. Also fell back under right here. Also old resistance here. So this could be a back test level, classic old resistance turning into new support. And obviously since it already had a pretty strong bounce from here, this bounce, if it does bounce from here, it could be a little bit weaker. You might have to project a little bit lower. I was thinking maybe up to this little gap start first maximum. So at about 2270, that's where that gap starts. Maybe even 2229. But either way, it's a pretty good move. I mean, from this low, let's go from Friday's close up to here. So going up to 2220s, that'll give you 8% just on the underlying. If we go up to the gap resistance, that's giving you about 10% up to the gap. So if it does indeed want to bounce here, it's a pretty good return. Not too bad for calls. And another good thing is that the invalidation level is pretty close. I mean, your risk off is going to be, you know, under $20 at least. If it breaks 20, it could start entering that gap. If it breaks under 20, 30, it could start flushing a little bit too as well. So you have a pretty close risk off. So if that fails, you can quickly switch to something else and you can stop out. The loss shouldn't be too bad if it does indeed break this 20, 33 and also the 20 flat level. If you wanted to be specific, you could even mark the gap low. It's at 1976 starts here. So you could even use 1976 as a risk off as well. So it's a pretty good... I mean, it's not too bad if you kind of entering a discount area. It might need a one day bar as well, like a better kind of reversal signal because you are kind of just closing here Friday with a red bar, three red bars in a row, actually four red bars in a row. So definitely in a downtrend short term with the potential for holding up at the 20s, especially this 2033, maybe even the 1976 as a gap low. So that's where PLTR looking at calls just a little bit more cautiously. Same thing with Meta. I'm not looking at puts right away on this. I want to see some type of bar. I want to see if that 50 to 61.8% rejection will turn into something if we can get that rejection. So same with PLTR, be a little bit more cautious because you don't have like a one day bar confirming a reversal yet or anything. You're kind of just guessing off the lows here, hoping that this area will hold up because it's strong prior. So that's for PLTR, be patient. Same with Meta, be patient. All right, and on to the SPY. We usually go over what we were looking for last week. But unfortunately, I didn't make a video last week. So we'll have to go to the Discord. I made a mobile post real quick. 
I like to go over what we were looking for last week because then we can kind of see how it played out and why it played out. So you can see this is my post. I wasn't able to make a video. I unfortunately had to break the streak. I dropped a video every single week since October 2022, but I was out of town. I was with my grandfather spending time with him in the hospital, so I wasn't able to do anything, but I was able to make a mobile post. Here's my horrible mobile charting. I hate mobile charts. So you can see that SPY, we were looking for a move over 512.76 to 5.13 in order to reach supply at 5.16. So we pretty much had three points. So we broke out over 512.76 to 5.13. We had three points up to supply. So here was that. We did that the first day here on Monday. We actually opened and gapped over 512.76 and had a really nice run up into supply. It was hard for me to project any higher than supply because this is a pretty gnarly zone. I mean, it's a drop base drop zone. A very big sell imbalance followed this candle, so I wasn't sure if this is going to turn into big resistance or just short-term resistance. So that's pretty much what we were looking for on SPY. This week, we did close over that supply, so we closed over this 520 area. It's kind of the supply high. So now that this zone is invalid, we'll go ahead and get rid of it. We closed outside of it, and we could just use regular horizontal resistance lines now. So we do have a short-term peak right here at 520.75. We also have 518.50s. Comes from this little rejection bar right here. I believe that this zone will have to hold up. If it flushes under that 518.50s, that's a good chance it'll flush back down. Probably start trying to head back to maybe about 513s, 512s probably that 512.76 that we were looking for. So definitely mark your 524.61 It's your all-time high. It's kind of the max area you can project for upside. And then also mark that 520.75 comes from right here. Also mark 518.50s comes from right here. So you can see that the 518.50s kind of holds the back test here. Also was previous resistance right here. That's why this probably needs to hold overall. If it flushes back under that, there's a good chance it can go down. But right now we are over it, so you can't really expect too much downside. And then your 520.75, you can kind of see that it was just short-term resistance right here. Kind of at a stall out point right here as well once it got back over. This is just a very high level, so you can tell that the market's very, very slow. I mean, the one trade you could do Friday was that pretty much that gap filled down, and that was about it. And then the market got very, very slow. It's just low VIX environment. It gets very, very slow. Your ATRs tighten up, and it might not feel like the indexes are moving as much. A lot of people will start going into individual tickers and looking for other things. So yeah, that's for the SPY. I mean, the setup was the best last week, obviously. We you know, broke out of this little wedge that we were looking at. We had that drawn out last week, and you had that target up to supply, but now we've cleared that, and now we're so close to all-time highs, it's very hard to find a setup here. The one thing I would do is just mark that 520.75 and mark the 518.50s. If you do get a dip into those, look for dip buys or scalps off of that. I'm just not recommending a swing trade here at the moment. Maybe swing trade puts if it starts closing under 518.50s. That's something I'd be willing to consider. But otherwise, I would definitely just look for dip buys on scalps, uh, the 520.75 and the 518.50s if we can kind of get down there. And the max upside, I mean, you really only got up to 524.60s and that's your all time high resistance. So hopefully that makes sense. Obviously, the setup is not that great right now. Last week was pretty good. We had a confirmed breakout with room up to supply. Now we've reached that, even reached beyond the supply and we're at a pretty high level. So it's very tough. So just go ahead and mark those short term levels. Maybe look for call scalps off of that. You can maybe look for a put swing only if it closes under 518.50s. All right, not to QQQ. Let's go ahead and look at what we were looking at last week on my mobile post. So it looks like QQQ I put did have a great close over previous structure low and big res level at 432.74. If we hold over that, there's room to supply at 440. So that's pretty simple. Also at a scenario, if it dips back down uh, to 432.70s, you could look for dip buys there as well, but we never did get that. So here was that close over the 432.70s right here. That was a pretty solid signal that we had a straight shot up into supply. We never dipped into the 432.70s or anything Monday. So here was Monday's open, stayed right at the Friday high pretty much, and just ran straight up into supply. Also, really couldn't project any higher than this downtrend line. Test one, test two, test three. Small rejection. I was looking for more resistance at this area, just short-term resistance. We did not get that really. We had one little pullback from supply, and that was right here. We had a little gap down, about half a percent, nothing crazy, and we filled it back up. Came back up into supply right here, rejected supply, rejected supply right here again, and just lots of stalling out inside supply. One big gap up over the downtrend line, and then we kind of went back under it, closed back outside of it. So very tough area. I mean, there was a little bit of a setup, I guess, if you just bought the open on this downtrend breakout. You had about 15 to 30 minutes to sell. And then it's just a very big gap filled down. So very slow week. And this week, I feel like it's pretty straightforward. I mean, QQQ is still inside supply. If we do start closing back 
under this downtrend line with a more solid kind of one day red bar, some type of reversal signal, closing back inside this little downtrend line and closing back under this start of the supply zone about 440s. So move back under 440, it's a pretty straight shot down, I would say at least down to 432.70s. Maybe just to the little 50 EMA here, the one day 50 SMA actually, I changed the 250 to the simple moving average instead, it's just smoother. And it looks like that the 50 also meets with your nine and 21 EMA cloud right here, this little green thing. It's your nine and here's your 21. So you can maybe project down to that if we start closing back inside the downtrend line here. But I really don't like longs here at all. Like SPY, you're actually closing outside of supply and it's a little bit more clear. And that's why you kind of see SPY had a really good week last week and QQQ is a little bit more stagnated. So here's SPY, I mean, it's just a clear up thrust. And here's QQQ kind of stagnant, right? And I think that's because the supply here and also the downtrend line was a little bit more clear. So yeah, that's really about it. I mean, it's tough. I'm not gonna probably recommend to go long or buy calls inside the supply. You'd obviously need a very clear signal over 442 or so, kind of like this. So this 442 level kind of meets with the downtrend line. So if QQQ can get over 442, you know, you could scalp up to this high day right here, but that's about it. It's kind of tough. I definitely wouldn't want to go long inside of it just because you never know if it's just going to flush inside supply. Kind of what it did right here on Friday. And also when it got up here on Thursday, also when it got back up here on Wednesday, uh, got up here on Tuesday. So, I mean, just very stagnant, right? It's not a very good place to dip by unless you're buying outside the supply, you know, near the lows. So yeah, honestly, I really like the downside better here just because of the downtrend line, but really you would have to see it start closing back inside of that for me to be bearish. And that's really about it, guys. If QQQ can kind of turn into a wedge rejection here, that's a pretty good setup. And you kind of just trade back down to the moving averages, which is just a little bit lower. I mean, probably about seven to five points. So not too bad. That's about as low as I could project if we start getting back under that downtrend line. And it's just a really hard spot to go long, guys. I mean, it's very close to all time highs. It's inside this big supply. I mean, this is a really big sell imbalance. So something happened in this big green candle to lead to this big sell imbalance. And that's why we're kind of stagnant here. Obviously, SPY worked through it's pretty, pretty well. I mean, SPY had a pretty good supply here and sell imbalance and it worked through it pretty well. QQQ is just a little bit more stagnant. Could be waiting on NVIDIA earnings also in 10 days. Never know. And for earnings this week, we really don't have anything special. We have Home Depot on Tuesday and Walmart on Thursday, I believe. But that's really about it. You also have C Limited, uh, ticker symbol SE. It's a pretty nice ticker to trade. They have earnings as well. Maybe a couple others. But in terms of the big boys, it's really just Home Depot and Walmart. So yeah, that's it, guys, uh, for the indexes. We'll go over the VIX real quick. Hopefully, you don't feel like you're wasting your time watching this. I mean, I know it's the... The setups just aren't that good right now, and I really couldn't give you too much. Not like last week. Last week, we had a more clear breakout setup with a clear target up to supply. We just don't have that this week, so I can't really give you too much. You're definitely going to be waiting for a close back inside the downtrend to see more downside. And then for longs, it's just too hard to buy up here, honestly, inside supply. Maybe you could scalp off 442s. If QQQ keeps holding 442, you can maybe scalp up to 444. You got about two points right there, but that's about it. And on to the VIX for our last point of analysis. Our levels haven't changed. The VIX levels have always been the same. You got 1794, which is this rejection peak right here. Also at 1692, short-term peak right here. And then the 1540, which you've highlighted every single week pretty much. Multiple rejections. You got one, two, three, four, five, six bubbles here highlighting rejections for 1540. That's why once VIX gets over 1540, it increases so fast. Also it goes down very low when it gets back under 1540 as such. You also have 1367, which was a volatility signal we wanted to see weeks ago. So we had this level and we ended up breaking over that 1367 right here. And this turned into a very big push up. So that 1367 was key to get back up to 1540s. It did that weeks ago. So I marked that one. And then we also have 1237 low right here, low right here, low right here, low right here, uh, low right here. So multi bottom low. And then your all time low, at least for this little period right here at 1182, just this peak right here. You can find the VIX lower in past data, but right now we're focused on this period within the last year or so. So the VIX is approaching the lows. It's very, very risky to short when the VIX is this low. Unless you buy time, you want to buy 30 to 60 to 90 days of expiration. Let it fart around because you don't have any volatility. Nobody's mathematically pricing in a big move. That's why premiums are so cheap right now. I mean, zero days really aren't that bad. 
they're pretty cheap as well as the 30 days to expiration those are pretty cheap pretty much any any options they're pretty cheap right now because of the slow vix nobody's pricing in anything so if you really wanted to watch the vix just mark your 1237 level that we have marked and also mark your 1182 look for it to maybe hold up here i really wouldn't expect the vix to go too crazy from this point unless we start breaking under 1182 that would be a huge problem you probably see a very slow market at that point I really would like to see it hold up here and maybe bounce back up, see a short-term pullback in the market. It's good for volatility to get back up to a level, uh, and then the market will dip. VIX gets up to a certain level. You can buy the dip on SPY or QQQ, then the VIX will fall aggressively, and you'll get paid on calls pretty good just for buying that dip. So you like a little bit of volatility increase. It definitely increases the range, and it, it, it can increase your profit as well if you buy at the right spot. There's also a saying, when the VIX is high, it's time to buy. When the VIX is low, take it slow. Right now, the VIX is low. You can tell that the market's been taking it a little bit slower. At least we're getting to that point. So that's really it. I don't really have a signal here to tell you that the VIX is going to hold up yet. We don't really have a bar reacting to the lows just yet, bouncing. And we're kind of just selling. I mean, the VIX has been red for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight days in a row here. Just brutal. I mean, market's been bullish. There's no fear in the market, obviously, when it comes to the VIX. And volatility is going lower, as well as ATRs are tightening up. ATR is average true range. When average true range tightens, market feels a little bit slower. I like wider ATRs. I like to be able to make, you know, one to two point moves on the SPY on the underlying because it pays pretty good on options. If you can make a dollar or two on the underlying on SPY or QQQ, it's going to make you a pretty good amount of money. And when the ATR is widened and the VIX is a little bit wider, you can make one to two points on the underlying, you know, 15 to 30 minutes. And that's why higher VIX higher ATRs are so appealing. And that's why volatility is good for traders who are a little bit more seasoned. So that's really all I got for you guys. If the VIX does hold up here at 1237 and 1182 at these lows, max upside, I got you up to 1367. If we break back over 1367, that takes you up to 15 and 1540. So this is kind of free space. It also kind of respects the moving averages pretty good as well. You can see it held up the 921 and the 200 right here, bounced off of that short-term support bounce candle off the 200 SMA right here. And then once we lost the 921 EMA, you see that the cloud went red. Uh, we went back below and it's been trending below that since. Also a really big flush candle below the 200 SMA right here. So it works with the moving averages pretty good as well. If you want to pay attention to those, I definitely would on the VIX, but definitely mark these levels I have. Like I said, 1794, 1692, 1604, 1540, 1367, 1237, and 1182. Those are all very important one day levels. Some are velocity zones. Once VIX gets over, velocity increases. Once VIX gets below, velocity increases to the downside. And they're just very important and they worked very well, especially for signals and trading the SPY or the QQQ. So I love you guys. I'm glad I could make a video for you this week. I'm sorry I missed last week, but it's very important that I spend time with my grandfather. So keep him in your prayers if you're a believer or just Put some karma in the air for him, some good karma. We really need it. And I love you guys. I'm going to go ahead and get this chopped up, sent out, all that good stuff. And I'm out. There's a reason why Xtrades is currently the fastest growing application on the market for sharing financial ideas. With over $2.5 million paid in the last two years to contributors, users are flocking to see what trades the top traders on the leaderboard are sharing in real time. If you're looking to grow your reputation as a trader on the internet or discuss your trading ideas with other reputable investors, click the link below and get connected with the trading mentor today, completely free of charge.